Hi guys, I wanted to go over a technique for creating dynamic shadows called shadow mapping. So this is one of two really popular techniques for creating dynamic shadows. Uh, the other one being shadow volumes. So I won't go too deep into shadow volumes, um, but just to mention it, shadow volumes, you're basically going to project your 3D meshes in space um, from the camera. And then when they intersect with geometry, that's when you know that that geometry should be shaded. Shadow mapping, by contrast, is going to render the scene first from the light's perspective and output a texture that shows the depth that the light sees each object at. Um, and then it's going to use that shadow map when it does the actual rendering to test which points were visible from the light source and which were not and it's going to use that to determine which points should be shaded. So I'll take you through the basics of shadow mapping and then kind of deep dive into some of the common problems that people have uh, because I basically ran into all of them. Um, so I have some examples from my engine showing problems like shadow acne, Peter Panning, etc. Here's the final product. Um, you can see my mesh and the dynamic shadow that it's casting. Um, that's basically just a white ground plane that he's standing on and that's what's being shaded here. So conceptually what's happening when we want to determine whether something is in shadow or not, we need to determine if it's visible from the light source. So here we have our light source coming in from the top right of this picture and the right side of his body, which is seen by the light source should not be shaded. The shadow on the ground, which is not seen by the light source, should be shaded. Our method to tell whether a point should be in shadow then is just to compare the depth from the light's point of view in the shadow map to the distance to that point from the light source when we're rendering in the fragment shader. So let's look at how a shadow map is generated um, and what the result looks like. Here's a diagram from NVIDIA they are actually talking about cascading shadow maps, so they have multiple, but you can see the viewer, Frustrum, is looking at some trees, and th then the light source also has its own projection, Frustrum, which is rectangular, um, coming from the light source and covering not only the objects that the viewer is looking at, but also any objects that might shadow any of the objects that the viewer is looking at. So I don't want to go too far into the math of it, um, but basically the, the render pass from the light's point of view, the world view matrix will, instead of the viewer's camera, give you the position of the light source so that it's drawn from the light source. And the projection matrix will be orthographic because it's a directional light. And it needs to basically be large enough to cover the objects in the scene that the viewer is looking at and any objects that could be in the way. Once we have our view and projection matrices, we simply render the scene and keep only the depth component, which is just going to be grayscale 0 to 1, and output that as a texture. So here I actually have an example of what that texture looks like. And you can see it's pretty much all white except this little black blob. Um, the white would be the floor, the black blob would be the mesh of the guy, um, and it doesn't look like there's a lot of information in that black blob in terms of which parts of his body are closer to the light source. Um, but I have another version here where I took the black blob and just normalized it um, from zero to one. So you can see that there is actually quite a bit of depth information there um, in our shadow map. And that's basically going to be bound and used when we render the scene from the viewer's perspective. Using that fragment shader as a texture and sampling from it in our fragment shader, we now have all of the information that we need to make that comparison we talked about at the beginning to be able to see for this pixel, was the light source able to light this or was it hidden from the light source? In order to see how we actually use the shadow map in the fragment shader, I'm throwing up some shader code. So you'll see at the top light depth texture being bound to a sampler. That's going to be the black and white texture that I just showed you. That's the shadow map. And then just below that, we have this light world projection matrix. That matrix is going to tell us in our normal 
fragment shader, how to transform from a world space coordinate into a coordinate within that orthographic projection from the light that we just rendered in. So we want to compare two distances to determine if we should shade this particular pixel or not. Um, the first is just the distance from the light source to this pixel. Um, so that's going to be light depth.z. After we put our world space coordinate through light world projection matrix, the z value is how far from the light source this point is. And then we want to compare that with the other distance, which is how far was the closest thing from the light source along this path. So the xy coordinate after we put our fragment world coordinate through the light world projection matrix, that xy coordinate is going to give us the coordinates in the shadow map that we want to sample to find out what that distance was. If the first distance, the light source to this fragment, is larger than the second distance, the light source to the first thing it saw, then we know that this fragment is further away than whatever the light source saw. So that means this fragment, there's something in between this fragment and the light source, so this fragment should be shaded. If the distances are equal, so if the distance to this fragment from the light source is the same as the nearest thing the light source saw, then we know that this is illuminated by the light source and we don't want to shade it. So if you're carefully paying attention, you might realize that I am comparing floats for equality from two totally different things, right? One is a floating point value from when we rendered the scene from the light's point of view into a texture and are sampling it. And then I'm comparing that float against a value from a totally different program that I'm running from the, you know, the camera's perspective. Um, those probably aren't going to match exactly. Um, and that leads us to our first problem. So I'll throw that up now. This is sort of the first problem that you run into doing shadow mapping. Um, this is called shadow acne and it's really disgusting looking. Uh, you can see kind of these striations. It's just like zebra stripes everywhere. Um, and I'll throw up a diagram that kind of explains why it occurs in this stripe pattern. Um, but at the end of the day, the problem is that you're comparing two things that are almost equal um, and they're becoming greater or less as you go along the surface. So here's that diagram, um, and it's just showing how basically that zebra pattern is being caused by those squares, which are really the pixels of our shadow map. So the fact that we have a finite resolution to our shadow map, um, and then we do this equality check means that basically the, the shadowness kind of oscillates above and below zero, and we get this nasty stripe pattern. So there are a couple of ways to resolve the shadow acne problem. Um, I'll throw up the first of the methods here, um, which is called a shadow bias. And that's just a fancy name for like this fudge factor. Literally, we're just taking the whole scene, the shadow map from the light's perspective and shifting it a tiny, tiny amount. So like 0 0.02, you just shift the depth information from the, sh from the light source by 0 0.02. And then, you know, things that are still clearly behind, like the ground behind our guy are still clearly behind. Um, but the things that are supposed to be seen by the light source are now, you know, 0 0.02 in front of it. So you avoid this kind of equality problem. So here's what it looks like after we've resolved the shadow acne. Um, you might notice a couple of things are still wrong with our shadow. One is just that it's really blocky. Um, and we'll get to that in a moment. First, I want to talk about the other issue. Um, you can see towards his foot, the shadow is actually detached. Um, this is a result of the shadow bias that we just applied. And it's because we basically took that depth information and pushed it. So now, right where an object meets the surface that it's shading, there's this disconnect. Um, and that has a great name. It's called Peter Panning when the shadow is detached. Um, so that's kind of a side effect of the bias approach. There are ways to sort of make a fancier bias um, but I won't get into those. Instead, I'll show you the other technique, which I think is really nice. And this is front face culling. So instead of culling the back faces when we render from the lights perspective and generate that shadow map, we're going to cull the front face and only render the back faces. So this is going to resolve that issue where we were dealing with this 
near equality between you know what the light source saw as the closest object and when we actually tried to render that closest object. Um, so now the closest thing that the light will see is the back face of the object. So the front face of the object that the light is actually seeing will be clearly in front of whatever depth our shadow map holds, because that's the back face. And then if something is behind that back face in shadow, like the ground, um, that will still be clearly behind the back face of that object. So now we have basically three levels, right? We have the front face of the object that's getting hit by the light. Then we have the back face, and that's what's in the shadow map. And then we have whatever's behind that back face, like the shadowed ground. So literally just by changing the call mode when we're creating our shadow map, we can really nicely resolve this shadow acne problem without dealing with any complicated bias or Peter Panning. So we're still left with a really blocky shadow. And I'm going to show a couple of techniques to reduce that effect. Um, but at the end of the day, this is really the big downside of shadow mapping. Um, you are rendering from the light's perspective to a 2D texture with a finite number of pixels. So there's only so much data that you can hold in that image. And depending on where you're viewing the scene from, especially with relation to where the light source is pointing, you can end up with you know, these perspective aliasing problems. And it, it's not always something that you can 100% fix. Um, so I'll show a couple of ways to reduce the effect. And the first one here is just going to be increase the resolution of the shadow map. Um, so we started with a shadow map that was 1024 by 1024, and I'm just going to increase that to 2048 by 2048 and show you the effect. So you can see our shadow looks pretty good now, um, but keep in mind that I've quadrupled the size of our shadow map texture um, to a 2K texture, which is not tiny. And, you know, we're still pretty far from the ground. If we zoomed in, we would still see those blocks. So just increasing the size of the shadow map texture is not really a permanent solution. One way that people deal with this is they create multiple shadow maps that cover different regions of the scene. Um, I won't go into a lot of detail here, um, but this is called cascaded shadow mapping if you want to look it up. And again, that diagram from the start of the video um, from NVIDIA shows you kind of what those look like. Even with this really large resolution shadow map, um, we still have a pretty visibly jagged edge to our shadow because it basically goes from zero to one. What we'll do first here is called PCF, percentage closest filtering. Um, and basically for every point that we're testing the shadowness, we're going to test a bunch of points around it on the shadow map and combine them into one result. This will also soften our shadow, um, although that's sort of configurable based on how far apart you sample on the shadow texture. So here's our shader code again. And you can see instead of just simply sampling the shadow map texture at the shadow map cores, I create a box, a three by three kernel around that point, And I sample each of those points on the shadow map. And then I combine them into one shadow value. So let's look at what the result of that is. Um, you can see that the boxes are a little less prevalent now, um, but we do still have this artifact if you zoom in. So you can see basically still these blocks. They're sort of, it's sort of a banding on the edge of the shadows. And that especially depends on sort of the angle of the object with respect to the pixel in your shadow map. So you can see on a shoulder, it's pretty bad banding. So we can improve our PCF technique. Basically, instead of sampling this three by three box around that point on the shadow map texture, we can sample sort of equidistant random points around that point on the shadow map texture. Um, and the way that we generate those random points is called Poisson disk. So it's a fancy way of just saying, you know, create a random configuration of points where they're all at least some distance away from each other. Throwing up some new shader code, you can see we have this list of hard-coded Poisson disk sample points. So those are what I'm going to use instead of that 3x3 box. So instead of you know a grid of points around what I want to sample, I'm going to use this random distribution of points 
around what I want to sample. Looking at the result, we can see there's less banding um, and there's more grain. So it's grainier around the edge, but it's less banded. Um, at the end of the day, you can't create you know, more accuracy in your shadow map than you had using this technique. Um, the idea is just, you know, visually we're less good at, at noticing noise in an image than we are at noticing something like banding. Um, so it's just kind of trading one for the other. And the idea, especially as you zoom out to a normal resolution, is that, you know, this is a less noticeable artifact along the edges of your shadows. So now we have a pretty good dynamic shadow. Um, and it doesn't really matter what the objects in your scene are doing, if they're moving. Um, you know, this technique really is agnostic of that. As long as you, you know, have skinned and animated all of your stuff when you're rendering from the light in the same way that you did when you're rendering your scene, the shadow should match up. Um, and so things like self-shadowing are going to work fine. Um, and I think this is a pretty good technique for relatively cheap to get dynamic shadows. So yeah, um, I'm not there for questions, obviously, um, but if you do have any questions or thoughts about this um, or any mistakes beyond my ugly shader code, uh, yeah, feel free to just reach out, um, post something on Piazza, uh, and I'd be happy to read it and respond. Thanks, guys.